All right, let us continue with renormalization group and the effective field theory. Today we will discuss several topics and the first of them is a core topic to understand why the combination of renormalization group plus EFT is so useful because we will actually discuss how uh, the combination resums large logarithms which is the technical outcome of uh, the combination. So we have the following section, 533 resumming logarithms. application of renormalization group plus EFT uh, or even without uh, EFT but in particular in the combination. So again we work in phi to the four theory in the MS bar scheme and we neglect the mass of the particle in the phi to the four theory and uh, we look at large logarithms which can appear in a physical calculation. The relevant renormalization group ingredients are the beta and gamma function. The beta function gives the running of the coupling and we write it as a power series in the coupling constant. It starts with g to the second power. So g times a sum over l big or equal than one times a coefficient beta L times G to the L and L stands for the loop order. At every loop order there is one additional power of the coupling and at one loop order we have G square. And similarly there is a gamma function which governs the running of the field normalization and it is simply given by a similar sum gamma L times g to the l, so the running starts at order g. Then let us look at some endpoint green function. Let's say g with n field operators is in general a function of the coupling and explicitly of the regularization scale mu. And as usual, we do not write physics arguments like energy, momenta, and so on. They exist, of course, as well. But depending on the green function at lowest order, um, the lowest order Feynman diagrams contain some number of vertices. I mean, for a four-point, six-point function, it might be a non-irreducible diagram with a certain number of vertices. Therefore, at lowest order, we have some power g to the capital N and n depends on the green function, but then at every additional loop order, there is one additional power of the coupling. So we get a sum L from zero to infinity, g to the L times some function, some coefficient function, TL. Okay. So uh, here the sum starts at zero because the green function, of course, may have a zero loop a contribution, a three-level contribution. The beta and gamma functions have no three-level contributions after epsilon has gone to zero. And uh, so the dependence on the coupling is explicitly a power series. Therefore, these coefficient functions can only depend on mu. And of course, the coefficient functions will also depend on momenta energies of the physical process, but not on the coupling. Then, what do we know about the coefficient functions? At three level, the coefficient function cannot depend on mu because mu only enters via loops. Therefore, at three level, t0 is a constant, which is mu independent. Then, at the higher order, the question is, what is the mu dependence? And intuitively, we have already discussed in the last le uh, lesson that uh, the renormalization group equation is not fulfilled 
at order by order, but it governs a relationship between different orders of perturbation theory. So in this notation, the uh, tree level is not mu dependent, but the running of the coupling is then of one loop order. And uh, the running of the one loop coupling is canceled by the one loop mu dependence of the T1. And so there is always such a relationship. And uh, today we will analyze in more detail what is the implication of this particular uh, um, relationship. So anyway, so this is the L loop coefficient. And it is mu dependent. But the question is, what is its mu dependence? So let's put here an argument. Okay, and there is now a statement which we are going to prove. The statement is that this TL of mu is a polynomial in ln mu of order L. So this is like at one loop where we saw explicitly ln mu terms. We never saw ln mu square terms, but um, that is representative for the general case at all loop orders. It is an L loop, uh, L degree polynomial. So we can write it technically in the following way to make it explicit. TL of mu, the function of mu, is actually a sum of some index m from zero to L of, how do we call it, TL comma M times ln mu to the power M. Okay. That is how it can be expressed. And then we have made explicit the fact that it is an L degree polynomial in ln mu. And then of course, as I said before, uh, there is always also a dependence on energies and momenta. And so this coefficient here can still depend on energies and momenta. And clearly what must happen in the end is that uh, the ln mu will be accompanied with other logarithms of energies and momenta such that we always have dimensionless arguments of the logs. That must come from here, <coughs> some combination. But anyway, we can now establish this statement on the mu dependence. And it technically simply follows from the fact that the renormalization group equation establishes that relationship between different orders in perturbation theory. So we will get some iteration or recursion formula um, which gives us uh, the next order in terms of the previous one. Let us prove it. Let us assume that it is true for L equals zero. So actually, is it true for L equals zero? Yes, because at L equals zero, we have a mu independent constant. That means uh, TL um, at zero's order is of course a polynomial of zero's degree in ln mu. Then let us also assume as an induction that it is true for um, let's say all the previous orders, zero up to L minus one. And uh, then let us prove that from this, we get uh, that the statement is also valid at uh, loop order L. And then we have an induction. So under these two assumptions, we get the following. We simply write down the renormalization group equation and work it out. So the renormalization group equation tells us that zero is equal to a differential operator, namely d by d ln mu partial derivative plus beta times d by dg um, plus n times gamma, the anomalous dimension. That um, differential operator acts onto the green function, and the green function is uh, given in this, is in this way, g to the n overall times a sum of L equal, oh, let's call it L prime now because L is fixed. That is the overall loop order we are considering. But here we have a sum over L prime from zero to 
to infinity in principle of the coefficient function TL prime of mu times G to the L prime. So that is our equation. And uh, from this, we want to establish our statement by plugging in that we assume the statement is already true for all the indices L prime, which are smaller than L, and then we establish it for the index number L. And uh, it comes from the fact that the beta and gamma function are of one loop order, and that uh, gives us the desired uh, relationship. So simply let us look at the order g to the n plus L. That is the next order that we need. The green function has already this number of Gs at tree level, and if we want to look at L loop order, then that is the order in the coupling that we need to look at. So let us isolate all the terms in the equation of that order. Where do these terms come from? So here, the partial derivative with respect to L and mu simply acts on the coefficient functions which are independent of G, therefore, from this partial derivative, which term in the sum contributes d by d l and mu? Only one term in the sum contributes, namely the one where we have here g to the l without prime. So the term with l prime equal l, this term contributes, and then we get d by d l and mu of g to the n plus l times t l without prime of mu. That is the relevant term from the first term in the sum. Then beta times d by dg and n times gamma. So here we use the fact that we uh, mentioned this is of uh, order. So beta starts at one loop. So beta contains at least g square. Therefore, beta times d by dg raises the number of g powers by at least one. And gamma starts at g to the one, so it also raises the power of g by at least one. So it's of order g to the at least one loop order. Okay. Therefore, if we act with this differential operator in combination, beta d by dg plus n times gamma, we act on the sum then which terms in the sum now contribute L prime from zero to infinity? Not all terms contribute. If we overall want to have this power and the differential operator is at least of order G to the one. So we need here only terms where the overall power of G is less than this. What does it mean for our index L prime? So in the sum L prime Several values of L prime contribute. So zero contributes, one might contribute, and so on. But only the terms between zero and L minus one, they contribute. And then we have here T L prime of mu times overall G to the N plus L prime. And then this power is always less than the power we want. And here we have at least G to the one. Then, of course, we now know that here our induction hypothesis uh, is at work because we have terms here only of lower order, and therefore we have assumed that this already is a polynomial of the required degree, so we can plug it in. And uh, what is then the result? So this is a polynomial of degree, which degree is it? Up to L minus one in L and mu. And uh, so therefore, um, if we act with it, uh, with the differential operator onto this polynomial in L and mu, it remains a polynomial in L and mu because only the G powers are modified a little bit, but it remains a polynomial so also this whole thing is a polynomial of degree L minus one in L and mu, and therefore uh, this here must also be a polynomial of degree L minus one in L and mu.
the partial derivative of TL of mu with respect to L and mu is a polynomial in L and mu of degree L minus one. Okay, what is a function whose first derivative is a polynomial of degree L minus one? It is a polynomial of degree L. Okay, so therefore we are done. That's it. So this is the whole proof. At every order, um, any green function in a quantum field theory is a polynomial in L and mu, and uh, it is a polynomial of degree corresponding to the loop order. So one loop L and mu, two loop L and mu square, and so on. Very simple statement, but very powerful. So we have full control over the L and mu dependence, and you see again that the uh, um, polynomials are actually related. So it is not only that we know that there is such a polynomial, but actually the proof tells us more. If you look at this uh, line here in the proof, it tells us a lot more, namely the polynomial of the next order can actually be constructed directly from the polynomial at the previous order. You do not need to do loop cal calculations in order to get this LMU dependence. In fact, uh, the polynomial is almost completely determined by the previous orders if you know the beta and gamma function. There is just one little detail which is not determined by the lower orders. Who can see a detail which is not determined? A constant. A constant. So the LNMU independent part is not determined by lower orders, but the entire LNMU dependence at higher order is fully determined by lower orders if you know the beta and gamma functions. So for example, at one loop, the L and mu dependence can be constructed if you know tree level and the beta and gamma functions at two loop as well. How many loop orders of the beta and gamma functions do you need in order to construct? For example, at the one loop you want the L and mu part. Uh, do you need to know only one loop beta and gamma functions, or do you need also two loop beta and gamma functions in order to construct the L and mu part at the one loop level? So if you want to employ this equation at the one loop level, say L is one, then here you have only one term in the sum, where L prime is zero. The equation tells you d by d L and mu of this, is given by the constant times uh, this differential operator. So how many loop orders in the differential operator do you need in order to construct here the L and mu term? Just the first one. Just the first one. Do you ever need more than just the first one? For higher orders, for example, yeah, right. So this is something I want to uh, write down to give you a table and a recipe which orders you need for what particular purpose. So there are additional details, namely recursion formulas. And so for example, if you only want the highest power, the ln mu term to the power um, L minus one in this equation here, so if you read this equation, we are at the order L and in this equation, the highest L and mu term which can appear is uh, power L minus one because we take the derivative. And in order to get the L minus one term, uh, we here uh, need only the term in the sum where L prime is equal to L minus one, the highest power, the highest uh, polynomial term. We need everything else uh, contains only lower powers of the log. 
Then if we are here already at the order L minus one, then from the bracket we only need the one loop term, otherwise we get a too high power of the coupling. Therefore, in order to construct the highest power lock, we only need beta one and gamma one, the one loop coefficients. Red backwards, it means that if you have the one loop beta and gamma functions, you can construct at all loop orders immediately uh, the highest LMU um, term which appears in your calculation. And that means the one loop beta and gamma functions give you a possibility to resum uh, or to sum up all logarithms of this form. Let's make it explicit. So for example, in this equation, you get then here, if you plug in now this notation, the notation is that our functions TL of U are now written with some coefficients. Then uh, from the left term, the derivative gives us a power L times the coefficient TL comma L times uh, the derivative of the log. And uh, we can cancel the log between the two terms and on the right we have the only the beta one coefficient contributes and uh, that then acts onto the coefficient TL minus one comma TL minus one. So that will come with a coupling G to the power N plus L minus one. Then the derivative D by DG acts on it. That gives us a coefficient N plus L minus one times the one loop beta coefficient and then N times the gamma function n times the one loop gamma one coefficient. That is exactly uh, the term out of this equation which is proportional to this power of the log and this is exactly a recursion formula. If you know the lower order coefficient of the highest log power from this equation you get the uh, coefficient of the next uh, order highest log. So to make it maybe a transparent TLL is given by TL minus one comma TL minus one times the following fraction. You divide by L and then here you have minus beta one times N plus L minus one minus N times gamma one. That's it. So that makes explicit that uh, if you have three level T0, then you could construct the one loop coefficient T11, then the two loop T22 coefficient T33 and so on. You get the leading LNU to the power L at the L loop order. from the following ingredients from the tree level, T0 and beta one, gamma one. You need the tree level result for your green function and the one loop beta and gamma functions and then you can construct the leading logs. And so on. You could derive similar recursion formulas for the subleading logarithm, sub subleading logarithm, and so on. The recursion formulas will become more complicated, but the main point is you can get them. And anyway, the renormalization group equation automatically determines all those logarithms. And I just want to make this um, as a table. Maybe this last statement subleading. Ln mu to the power L minus one at L loop order. So just from looking at the equation, what changes if you have one power of log less, then here in this term also uh, one term uh, of lower order contributes but all the even lower terms do still not contribute so you need one term more here 
That means you need a one loop calculation of your green function in order to get started. And then here you need two loop beta and gamma functions in order to get the next iteration from T0 and T1 and um, beta 1 and 2 and gamma 1 and 2. So in here is then the following table. Let's say your green function. has the following structure. You have a three level contribution, one loop contribution, two loop contribution, three loop contribution, and so on. And uh, how does the contribution look like? At the three level, you simply have T0, which is a constant which doesn't depend on mu. At the one loop level, you have T1, comma, zero plus T1, comma, one times ln mu. At the two loop level, you have T2, comma, zero plus T2, comma, one ln mu plus T2, comma, two ln mu square, and so on. Maybe let's write also T3, comma, zero plus T3, comma, one ln mu plus T3, comma, two ln mu square plus T3, comma, three ln mu cube, and so on. Now, what is determined by what? Suppose you have done your three-level calculation of the green function, then what we have just discussed means that from three-level and the one loop beta and gamma functions, you get the leading log here. So you need beta one and gamma one in order to get the T11 coefficient. And with the same one loop beta and gamma functions, you also get this leading log term at the two loop level and the leading log at the three loop level and so on. So you automatically get all these leading logs at all loop orders if you only have these ingredients, three level and one loop beta and gamma functions. So however, uh, how do you get the sub-leading logarithm, the next leading logarithm, uh, in two ways. First of all, uh, from T0, if you multiply in this differential operator with two loop beta and gamma coefficients, you immediately get from T0 the sub-leading log at the two loop level. So here, beta two and gamma two, gamma two, they matter in order to uh, give you a partial contribution to this sub-leading log. But also, if you have a one loop term here, a one loop term in this equation, times a one loop beta and gamma function, you also get this subleading look. So here beta one and gamma one times the um, non-logarithmic one loop contribution also contribute to this. So in order to get the subleading look, um, you need uh, the more ingredients. You need first of all, not only tree level, but an explicit one loop calculation and you need the one loop and two loop beta and gamma functions. But then of course it goes on. So similarly, you would get from here this one and uh, then also at the two loop level using the same ingredients, you can predict the next two leading logarithm at all loop orders. And for example, in order to get the sub-sub-leading logarithm at the three loop level, of course, it, um, you need always one order higher. You would need an explicit two loop calculation and you need the three loop beta and gamma functions. So maybe let us also mark this here. This here are the leading logarithms. Here 
is here. So this is this diagonal here, and then the next term is always next to leading. Locks and so on. So, and you see that the renormalization group tells you the coefficients of all these logarithms. So we can summarize the renormalization group equation is a tool to identify and predict. LMU, which are potentially large logarithms. And often this is abbreviated as resummation. The term is not particularly um, fitting, but anyway, uh, it is often used like this. But you clearly now have this statement that the renormalization group equation tells you all about these LMU dependencies at all orders. Any questions to this? Yeah. Uh, are there any statements on the conversions of the coefficients at the given uh, log orders? Conversion. Ah, convergence. Mm. Um, actually, yes. Uh, these series, okay, from the recursion formula, for example, you will see that at higher loop orders, there is nothing like a factorial growth in the coefficients. Therefore, these series will typically converge. So these are convergent series. And that is in contrast to the statement which you probably know that ultimately the perturbation theory does not converge. But you see that the non-convergence does not come from the leading log terms, but it comes from those non-logarithmic terms. And by the way, we should also highlight this. So this column here, which doesn't contain uh, logarithms of mu, that is the only thing that cannot be predicted, and therefore this is the only thing that actually needs to be computed by explicit L-loop calculations. And this is also where the problems of non-convergence would come. So this needs an explicit loop calculation. Okay. So now the remark is, uh, why is this particularly useful if you combine renormalization group and EFT? Because if you um, know that the theory you are working in has only one physical scale, like one physical energy scale, which is relevant for your problem, then all the LMUs that we have now discussed must be accompanied with the single uh, log of the single energy scale in your process. So you immediately know that whenever you see Ln mu, you actually have Ln mu divided by the energy scale of your process. So a single scale theory is a theory where this knowledge of Ln mu becomes extremely useful for the physical interpretation of your theory. And when do you have a single scale theory? If you have an EFT where you have integrated out all the heavy particles which are too heavy for your energy, of the process such that the energy of the process is the only relevant energy scale that remains. Therefore, the combination is so useful. Okay, um, any other questions? If not, then we can now come to a new application of the renormalization group. And actually, the remaining time today, I would discuss a few maybe two or three um, small indications how uh, useful renormalization group equations are, but not useful in the sense of applications of EFT, but more useful in a general sense. And depending on time, we might do two or three.
and then in the next lectures we of course will come back to the combination renormalization group plus EFT. So I wanted to call this further developments. And the first one is called dimensional transmutation. It's a very interesting, I think, consequence of the renormalization group idea. And let us, for this purpose, look at a very important application, namely a pure QCD, strong interaction theory, the theory of quarks and gluons with SU3 gauge invariance. Let us set the quark mass to zero. That uh, means pure QCD um, corresponding to the idea that the quark masses would arise from electroweak symmetry breaking. So as long as you do not consider electroweak interactions, the quark mass are naturally zero and you just have a purely massless theory which contains um, gluons and quarks and they interact with a Lagrangian which contains only dimension four operators. So um, in this theory, the Lagrangian contains no dimension full parameters. The only parameter which appears in the Lagrangian is the gauge coupling that appears in the covariant derivative and the field strength tensor. So then we know the theory is renormalization group invariant. That means uh, the theory actually does not depend on the value of the renormalized coupling only, but it depends on the value of this very bare coupling constant that we called GB with a capital B, which is also mu dependent. So the theory is specified by a choice of this very bare coupling GB and let's draw a picture. So it is given in a diagram of Ln mu square and the coupling. G without index, we have these trajectories. They look like this. They have poles at some low values of Ln mu square and at high Ln mu square, they converge to zero. We already know that. And so, uh, in this point of view, the theory is specified by specifying on which trajectory are we actually. So each value of GB corresponds to a different trajectory. And so specifying the value of this GB means which trajectory have we chosen. Good. But now let us look at the graph and uh, there are two equivalent ways to specify on which trajectory we are. Either we can say uh, the value of G capital B, uh, which is unphysical because it uh, is also epsilon dependent and so on. But uh, we could, for example, write the graph like this, Ln mu square G, again the same, sorry, the same graph. And uh, of course, the natural thing would be to say, um, we specify our theory by choosing a value of the renormalized coupling. Um, but in order to specify a renormalized coupling, we must now specify a value of mu at which we provide the value of G. So we would provide a reference scale. And at this reference scale, we specify a value g of mu zero, let's say, and then the theory is specified by giving you the numerical value g at a value, for example, mu zero equal 100 GeV or something like that. So the theory can be equivalently specified by the choice of g at reference value mu zero. Okay, so that is not particularly surprising or deep, but let us go on. Ln mu square and 
and here again the same trajectories as before. And uh, since they have this property that the trajectories approach zero at large mu square and infinity at small mu square, it is clear that uh, we can equivalently specify which trajectory are we on by fixing a reference value of the coupling constant and then specify what is the value of mu at which we obtain this particular reference value of the coupling. So we would say mu of some reference value g0. So we do not give a value, numerical value of a coupling, but we provide a numerical value of mu at which the coupling has a certain value, for example, coupling constant equal to one at either mu equal one GeV, mu equal two GeV, and so on. So this is an equivalent way to specify um, which QCD are we actually working with. So it is a choice of mu at some reference value G zero. You can either specify the numerical constants in your theory by specifying actually the coupling constant, which is the obvious thing, or specifying mu at which the coupling constant has a certain value. But what has now happened? Something very deep has happened, namely a dimensional transmutation. You have replaced a dimensionless parameter g in favor of a dimension full parameter mu. And that has profound physical implications. Let's write them down. So we have created a dimensionless parameter g in favor of a dimension full parameter mu. And uh, this exchange is called dimensional transmutation. And what is the physics implication of that if we really work in pure QCD as we wanted? Originally, if you look at the Lagrangian, it seems that the Lagrangian contains one parameter, namely the gauge coupling G. And obviously you would expect that the value of the gauge coupling matters for uh, the physics outcome of your theory. So seemingly there is one input parameter, G. But now we have discovered that uh, specifying G is equivalent to specifying a dimension full value of mu. That is dimension full. And what is the physical role of uh, giving a numerical value of a dimension full parameter. It just specifies your physical unit. You only give uh, meaning to your unit of mass or your unit of energy. So whether you say mu is one GeV or mu is two GeV, just defines what you mean by the term GeV. And therefore, choosing different values of mu do not change the physical theory at all. And that means there is a really no parameter in QCD. There is just the possibility to choose a value of a unit. But that has no physics implication. So you can have the following viewpoint. QCD only depends on mu, but this is equivalent to a choice of a unit. Choice of the unit of energy. And that means that no physical result
can depend on mu and what are physical results. Uh, the unit is, choice of unit is always unphysical, whether you call something a meter or a millimeter or two meters or a kilometer or GeV or atomic mass units or astronomical uh, unit, doesn't matter. The only thing that you can actually measure is uh, dimensionless ratios of quantities. Maybe the ratio between your unit meter stick divided by some length uh, of some ball throw or the size of a proton compared to your uh, length stick of one meter. How many protons fit into your one meter stick? So you have two physical objects, both described by the same theory, and it's only the ratio that you can actually measure. And uh, therefore, physical results are always dimensionless ratios. They cannot depend on uh, your basically naming convention of your unit. Therefore, QCD has zero free parameters, and that is a nice statement. So, pure QCD has zero free parameters. And in this sense, it is an ideal physical theory. So I would say QCD in this sense is the most beautiful physical theory. Uh, for this reason, it has zero input parameters except for the fact that you specify some discrete choices like SU3 gauge group and a certain discrete number of quarks uh, in the theory. But otherwise, it has zero free parameters, but it predicts a plethora of very interesting and rich physical phenomena. With these uh, zero input parameters, it predicts confinement at low energies, it predicts bound states like the proton, the neutron, pions, kaons, all with certain masses. And the non-zero masses of the proton and the neutron are predicted by this zero parameter QCD. It predicts then, of course, asymptotic freedom at high energies. It predicts phenomena like jets uh, at LHC. All of this is predicted by QCD. And uh, this, uh, without having any input parameter, it predicts, for example, the ratio between the different masses of the different bound states, uh, proton, delta resonance, uh, eta mesons, whatever. They have certain mass ratios. These are dimensionless physical uh, predictions of the theory, and they are predicted by this uh, parameter-free theory. And similarly, it predicts at which energies in maybe in terms of the proton mass, say if you, the proton mass is the natural unit of energy in this theory, as, uh, dynamically it generates an energy scale, namely the proton mass, and then how many uh, proton masses do you need in terms of energy to produce jets at the LHC and uh, the phenomena that we see at the LHC. So all of this is predicted by QCD without free parameter, and so. I would really say it is the best physical theory that uh, exists, and in that sense, it is the role model for everything that you would hope for. So in this case, this mu, because they have no parameter, is basically just a unit, right? Yes, so it is just a unit. And, um, but why can't we also, I mean, in the standard order, we have three parameters, right? Why can't we also, like, um, is there some way to also interpret there via some other way or some, some Yeah, there are dimensionful fundamental parameters in the standard model. For example, ultimately the Higgs vacuum expectation value. And uh, there are dimensionless ratios of parameters in the standard model, like the ratio between the three different gauge couplings. And these are physical parameters. And so therefore, the standard model, of course, does have physical parameters. 
So maybe it, uh, you might uh, consider that it has one parameter less than you would naively think, um, but that is not very important because the standard model has already some dimensionful parameters and therefore the value of mu uh, that you choose is not just the choice of the unit because you would uh, have to uh, explain or, uh, the ratio between mu and the other dimensionful parameters in the standard model Lagrangian is of course physical and therefore you cannot use the same argument in the same way. But uh, I wanted to make some remarks also on the standard model anyhow because um, dimensional transmutation and the uh, uh, calculation that is behind it is also of interest to look at in the full standard model. But uh, first looking at QCD, we have this simple statement that uh, we have a parameter-free theory. And the fact that we have a parameter-free theory is really a quantum effect. In the classical limit of QCD, there is no such thing. Because at the classical limit, uh, there are no beta functions, there are no running couplings, so and there is no renormalization, and so the trajectories would be flat. They would be um, horizontal lines. And therefore, in the classical limit, this would work, and you would need to specify the numerical value of the gauge coupling, and that would determine uh, the nature of the classical solutions to the equations of motions in QCD. But this step would be impossible. You could not trade the gauge coupling on the classical level in favor of some dimensionful parameter, and therefore say it is equivalent to a choice of the unit. In the classical limit, it is not equivalent to the choice of a unit. So classical QCD has one free parameter, but QCD at the quantum level has zero free parameters. So that is really an important outcome of the quantum theory. Which makes it even more ideal, I would say. You know, it just increases the advantage of this whole point of view. QCD viewed fully as a quantum theory with uh, all of these quantum effects is a parameter-free theory and uh, at this quantum level it predicts these phenomena that we mentioned before, confinement, asymptotic freedom and everything in between. Good, let us now look at uh, QCD embedded in the standard model. So here the standard model defines a mass scale. For example, the Higgs vacuum expectation value or uh, the mass of the Z boson, which is easier and more unambiguous to measure. And then uh, going through these steps, you could uh, naturally say that QCD has one physical parameter, namely the coupling constant at this value of mu equal mz. And what is then the role of dimensional transmutation? It is basically an interesting calculation that you can do. G of mu is uh, fixed at some large scale. Mu equal to mz. And uh, numerically, we would get g square of mz divided by 4 pi. This is alpha uh, for the strong coupling constant. Uh, it is known and it is measured to be around 0 0.1. So it is a small quantity. Um, but actually the gauge coupling G of mz is approximately 1. And then G squared divided by 4 pi is approximately 0 0.1. So then uh, there is this Landau pole of the trajectories at small energies and we can calculate its value. So um, the relationship is 1 over g square at mz minus 1 over g square at the Landau pole, which is 0, is equal to beta 1 times ln 
lambda square divided by mu square, where lambda is the value of this Landau pole. And uh, then you get an exponential uh, solution for this lambda square is equal to, so mz, so mz square, lambda square is mz square times the exponential of uh, 1 over beta 1 g square of mz. And so here we have a formula that we have already seen last uh, lecture. A non-perturbative formula, this uh, exponential of 1 over a coupling square, which has an essential singularity at coupling equal to 0, so it's a non-perturbative expression. And if we plot it, it looks somewhat like this. So here we have the energy scale mz. Here we have our ln mu axis. And at some very small energy, we have a Landau pole, and so the trajectory looks approximately like that. And uh, so the point is now that our fundamental energy scale of the full theory is a very large value mz, like almost 100 GeV. And this non-perturbative expression predicts that QCD generates some complicated non-perturbative dynamics which produces dynamically a new energy scale at which we get confinement and non-perturbative bound state phenomena and the energy scale is exponentially suppressed by this non-perturbative formula. And we have a obviously numerically large separation of the two scales and uh, the formula is non-perturbative and uh, it corresponds to a dynamical generation of these um, mass scales of bound states. So that is what I want to write down. So we have here um, dynamical generation of an exponentially small mass scale with non-perturbative dynamics like confinement bound states etc. Okay. So very interesting physics happens here and of course also here in the region where the coupling becomes very large perturbation theory is not trustworthy anymore, so probably the true trajectory of the running coupling is different from the plot. Um, but it is clear that non-perturbative physics sets in and takes place and uh, dynamically generates these phenomena that we have seen. So that is very nice. So this is uh, an equivalent use of uh, the renormalization group equation which is related to the phenomenon of dimensional transmutation. And so also this is a role model. If you um, have some small mass scale which um, uh, you are interested in, you might want to explain dynamically using some fundamental theory where this mass scale comes from. And here QCD gives you one example how it can work. Uh, let us say uh, fundamentally you have the weak interactions which have a Higgs vacuum expectation value, then uh, the theory of QCD plus beta functions gives you the explanation why at some exponentially smaller energy scale there are non-perturbative bound states. Okay? We have the explanation, so that is good. But current uh, open questions in physics are, for example, where does the vacuum expectation value of the Higgs come from? Uh, is there some dynamical origin of the scale of uh, the Z mass and the scale of the Higgs mass and the scale of the Mexican head shape of the Higgs potential? And for this we do not have an explanation. But this gives us an idea of how an explanation might look like. And many people have tried to figure out explanations of the origin of the Z mass and the Higgs mass using similar lines of thought, such that uh, the Z mass would be maybe the outcome 
of a similar non-perturbative um, calculation. And uh, are still around, but um, it is unclear whether any of these ideas is correct anyway. It remains an open question. Where does the scale of electroweak symmetry breaking come from? But here we have an answer. So this is what I wanted to tell you. Okay, how much more time do we have? Half an hour? Good. Mm, okay. Oh, I think that will fit nicely. So let me clean the blackboard once more. So then we have the section on the kallen semantic equation. Basically, you can think of uh, what is now coming as a reformulation of the renormalization group equation. But the f way of thinking behind it is a little bit different, and I will explain you at the end what is the different way. Anyway, let us start with the following observation, that there are two kinds of energy scales in a theory. The first kind of energy scale is what we have now mostly been discussing, namely mu and mass parameters, which are dimension-full parameters of the Lagrangian. So these energy scales are part of the definition of the theory, part of the definition of Feynman diagrams, and they are fixed once and for all. If we work in a fixed theory, then all of these parameters are constants of nature, basically, and they will not change within one particular calculation, or even of several calculations within that theory. So they are intrinsic. And on the other hand, there are, of course, physical energy scales like momenta, um, kinetic energies of particles, and they are experimentally accessible. Momenta and energies of particles, and they are, of course, uh, different depending on the process you are considering. And they are not only um, momenta and energies, but you could also go to position space, and then there are things like position, time, and so on, which are also dimensionful quantities. So x mu in general. So these two kinds of quantities are different, and uh, so far we have mainly focused on the first kind, but now let us focus uh, on the second kind of dimensionful quantities. Namely, we would like to work in a fixed theory and then discuss uh, physics, and physics means that we discuss how uh, observables depend on physical energy or length or time scales when the theory, however, is kept fixed. That is actually the natural thing to do. And so in particular, we now look at scale transformations. A scale transformation is a transformation which scales up or down all the energy and length and time scales of your um, physical observables. In other words, it scales up or down those experimentally accessible quantities. So in equations, we take any four vector x mu and transform it to some parameter t to the minus one times x mu. Any momentum four vector p mu becomes t times p mu. t is a real parameter. And for dimensional reasons, x and p, of course, scale in the opposite way. And also field operators in the Lagrangian, they also scale up or down 
according to the dimensionality of the field operators. So they would scale like t to the power d phi i, phi i times phi i, where d phi i is the dimensionality of the field operator. Now, um, let us ask, how do observables change under such a scale transformation? First question, uh, are observables scale invariant? Is physics scale invariant, for example, in nature, in real life, in our reality, here in the lecture hall, for example? Is physics invariant under such a scale transformation? Any ideas? I think most of you seem to think that it's not scale invariant. How would you say it is not scale invariant? So the dimensional transmutation would not apply. This idea from before wouldn't apply, you, you think. Is that what you have in mind? No, I mean, at like small scales, we use uh, like quantum effect dominoes, and on larger effects, uh, on larger scales, these effects just don't appear uh, at large, right? That is right, but maybe they still have some impact or they have zero impact, so that is the question. What would it mean if our uh, classroom would be scale invariant? It would mean that uh, every solution to the equations of motion would exist at all scales. So there should be tables of all sizes. Uh, in particular, the molecules inside of the tables should exist at all possible sizes. If you scale up or down, x and p, um, and physics would be invariant, you would have to have a molecule of this size, a molecule of that size, a molecule of that size. They should all be equivalent uh, solutions to the equations of motion. But somehow, the molecules uh, of everything, of air and tables and the floor and of you, they have some fixed sizes. Where do these fixed sizes of molecules come from? They come from some intrinsic uh, length scale that apparently exists in nature. So nature has some intrinsic length scale corresponding to the typical radius of molecules and atoms, like the Bohr radius of atoms. This is a fundamental length scale imprinted in nature. And of course we see it here because all the air molecules follow uh, this preferred length scale. There are no air molecules with twice the size, three times the size. But if the laws of nature would be scale invariant, all of such uh, molecules would have to exist, but they don't. So reality is not scale invariant. Yeah. Well, and also sometimes I guess if you want to send that around the Hagen universal length scale, but actually it's still about to change its length scale and it's more and prototyping the, s the scale of the field operator. Mm -hmm. The normalization of field operators can never influence an observable. It always drops out of the calculation of any observable. So therefore, this doesn't help. It really doesn't. Okay, but uh, anyway, let's write all of that down. Or in other words, let's discuss it in detail. First of all, this is a scale transformation. And uh, now step by step discuss to what extent something is invariant. And let us begin with a classical theory uh, where quantum effects are ignored. So for example, QCD with quark mass equal to zero again. So in QCD with zero quark masses, uh, the Lagrangian L classical contains no dimensionful parameter. And at, if, we work, uh, if we work only in the classical limit, then there are no quantum effects, no renormalization, and no mu. Therefore, uh, this is all we have. 
and then we can do the following. We can write down the action, which is a four-dimensional integral of the Lagrangian. We apply this scale transformation with a parameter t. And then what happens is that every term in the Lagrangian behaves as follows. Every term in the Lagrangian contains um, an operator consisting of field operators and derivatives. And the field operators, like the gluon fields, they scale with one power of t. Derivatives scale with one power of t. So, for example, a field strength tensor term, F mu, F mu, nu, contains two fields and two derivatives, scales like t to the fourth power. So the Lagrangian becomes itself times t to the four. But uh, the position scale in the opposite way, so the measure scales like t to the minus four, and therefore in the end the action is invariant under the scale transformation. And when would this invariance be broken? We would not have such an invariance if there would be an, an explicit mass term, because then we would not scale up and down the mass but only the field operators and the derivatives, and then such a term with a mass would, for example, scale with t to the third power, and then the t wouldn't drop out, and the action would not be scale invariant. So an explicit mass term would break explicit scale invariance. So explicit mass terms would explicitly break scale invariance. Just as a small remark, but let's keep working in the scale invariant classical theory. So in our assumption, we have no such mass term. Therefore, we have scale invariance of the action. And then uh, we have the following situation of physical quantities, like cross-section, for example, or any physical quantity, sigma, which depends on some set of momenta and which has a certain unit. Sigma would be mass to some power capital N. then this quantity would behave as follows. Sigma, if we plug in t times the momenta, then we get t to the n times the original result. So that is the simple statement for such a scale invariant theory. Okay. That is obvious. So just thinking of dimensional, uh, uh, dimensional arguments. So you have this trivial scaling up or down of all dimensionful quantities because nothing disturbs this simple scaling relation. Now, uh, in order to compare this very simple result to the results where scale invariance is not present, we want to write this in a more complicated way, namely as a differential equation. So, but please fix this very trivial relationship in your mind but um, we want to study what, uh, how it looks like if scale invariance is broken, and for that we will need a differential formulation. So we need a differential equation, and we can get this by doing d by dt at t equal one. Okay. So we take the derivative with respect to t at t equal one, and then you see the following. So here, the derivative with respect to t is equivalent to uh, the sum over all momenta, and then uh, pi d by d pi, sum over all momentum components of sigma. And uh, this is simply n times um, sigma. So you get the following equation. Uh, the sum over all momenta p d p i minus n applied onto sigma, that gives zero. That looks similar to a renormalization group equation, and it is. And uh, 
That is why it will be very useful to write the scale invariance relation in this way. And this derivative is, of course, the same as d by d l and p i. So that is just the inner derivative of the derivative with respect to t at t equal 1. So now let us write down the two changes. What happens if we have a dimension full parameter? We already saw it. Scale invariance is explicitly broken already on the classical level. But let us also go to the quantum level. And at the quantum level, scale invariance is broken by the incorporation of mu into dimensional regularization. So there are two breakings of scale invariance. And let us discuss them both. Quantum field theory with mass not equal to 0 and regularization plus renormalization. So we have then mu to the power 4 minus d. We have a very bare action. And we have green functions. of n, and we have a renormalization group equation which governs the mu dependence of our green functions. And we can now use all of the results that we have derived before. First, we do a dimensionful uh, or dimensional analysis, which is again trivial and has not yet anything to do with the renormalization group. We simply say a green function Gn uh, has unit of mass to the power n. And uh, what is actually the unit of mass of a green function in momentum space? So um, let me give you the result. It is n times the dimensionality of the field operator. So originally, the green function was the time-ordered expectation value of n field operators. So that would have the unit n times d phi. But then we do a Fourier transformation in order to go to momentum space. And that subtracts minus 4 times n uh, plus 4, where this plus 4 comes from the delta function, four-dimensional delta function of the sum of all incoming momenta, which always arises as a byproduct of the Fourier transformation to momentum space. But then we ignore this momentum conserving delta function. And uh, so we basically uh, divide out by it. And therefore, the unit of the ultimate green function is given by this formula. You can check it with examples. Uh, it's easy to see. So but then we know immediately a trivial statement namely the following. The green function uh, has the following scaling behavior. Now we need to uh, take into account that it depends on actual momenta and on all the variables that we had considered before. Okay. So the green function depends on physical momenta, it depends on the coupling constant, it depends on the mass parameter which is intrinsic to the theory, and it depends on the regularization scale which we must introduce at the loop level. Yep. Yes, yes, but for this trivial analysis we scale it anyway, and uh, then we get a trivial relationship and afterwards we use it to uh, understand what happens under this physical scaling transformation. So this is not yet uh, that transformation that we ultimately want. You are right. It is not. But that is simple to understand because here we trivially scale up and down everything which is dimensionful. And since we scale up and down everything which is dimensionful, it is totally clear from just looking at the units that this scales like t to the appropriate power n. There is no other way. And uh, that is just a knowledge that we want to have once and for all. So it scales up and down with t to the n times the uh, original arguments, pi, coupling, mass square, and mu. 
So this relation is a trivial dimensionful relation and it has nothing to do with scale invariance and uh, it has no physical implication, but it is a correct equation and we can use it to understand something physical. So from this equation, let us also derive a differential form by again taking the same kind of derivative with respect to t at t equal one. Then we get the following. Sum over all the momentum components, pi d by d pi from here, plus two times d by d ln m square from here, plus uh, partial derivative d by d ln mu minus capital N times the green function gn with all these arguments pi g m square and mu that is zero. So this is again a trivial relationship but formulated as a differential equation and now we can compare it to the relationship which holds in a scale invariant classical theory. This is the relation for a scale invariant classical theory that is the relation for a green function in quantum field theory. And what are the differences? The first term and the last term, they are the same. They correspond to the scaling, corresponding to the dimensionality. But the scaling variance from here is disturbed by these two terms. What is the meaning of the two terms? This breaks scale invariance because the theory has now an intrinsic mass scale, which appears in the Lagrangian. And this is a breaking of scale invariance coming from the need for regularization and renormalization. Breaking of scale invariance from intrinsic mass scale in the Lagrangian. And so that would also be present in a classical theory. And this is a breaking of scale invariance from the need for regularization plus renormalization. And now uh, maybe, um, oh, we have still three minutes, so let's go on. Maybe let me write here. You see now the mu dependence is governed by our famous renormalization group equation. Therefore, we can combine this with a renormalization group equation to give us a new equation, which is the kellen semantic equation and which then describes how scale invariance is broken in a quantum field theory. So let's do it quickly. renormalization group equation. So simply to write it down below, d by d ln mu plus beta times d by dg plus gamma m square d by d ln m square plus small n acting on the same green function is zero. So and the meaning of this is that this describes the change of parametrization of the theory. Including mu, while the physics is unchanged. So just to say it once more, remember the renormalization group equation is an equation which tells you how the parameters need to be changed in order to keep the physics the same. That is the meaning of this equation. Now, let us combine the two, and the combination is called kellen semantic equation. The point is to eliminate the derivative with respect to the explicit ln mu. So the kellen semantic equation differs from the renormalization group equation by 
uh, not having any more the derivative with respect to the regularization scale mu. Instead, it will have a derivative with respect to the physical momentum. Let's first write down the equation. The equation is the following. So basically you take this one minus that and then the ln mu drops out and everything else uh, changes a little bit. But so the uh, difference sum over all the momentum components, pi d by d pi, then plus the following, two minus gamma m square times d by d ln m square. Okay. These are the mass derivatives, two minus gamma m square, then plus beta times d by dg, uh, sorry, minus, minus beta times the derivative with respect to the coupling, and then minus small n times the following d phi minus four plus gamma minus overall four multiplied with gn equal to zero. So this is the combination when you take the uh, difference between the two previous equations and it tells you how observables change if you change the momentum scaling, you scale up and down the momentum, then the observables or green functions change and the change can be compensated or equivalently written as this combination of derivatives. at fixed mu under change of the momentum pi. So the first equation changes mu and keeps the physics constant. The second equation changes the physics, changes the momentum and fixes mu and studies how physics changes uh, under a scaling of the physical momentum. That is the meaning of the second equation. But mathematically, it's very strongly related via this trivial equation. So therefore, many people also use different names for the two different equations or use some mixtures under similar names. But for me, renormalization group equation changes mu, talent semantic equation changes p, and the rest follows. And then you have two different physical interpretations. And now you co we compare it once again just to a stop then with uh, the trivial equation. So that corresponds to scale invariance and it means change of scale of the momentum is simply corresponding to the overall dimensionality of the green function. That's all. These two terms uh, also exist here, change of momentum and the overall dimensionality of n, uh, or this n, uh, stands here. But it is modified. The dimensionality by which you scale up and down is modified by the gamma function here, and uh, the gamma function had the name anomalous dimension. And now you understand why it was called anomalous dimension, because it modifies effectively the way or the dimensionality that you need to put in to your Kalin-Semantic equation in order to compensate or to describe the change of scale of the momentum. So this is where the name anomalous dimension comes from. It modifies the capital N to capital N plus small gamma. And then there are additional changes. This change comes from the explicit breaking of scale invariance from the explicit intrinsic mass scale but the intrinsic mass scale also shouldn't change just with its uh, actual dimensionality too, but it also undergoes an anomalous dimension. Two minus gamma m square appears as the three factor instead of the naive two, which would appear in the trivial equation. So also this explains the name anomalous dimension for this gamma m square. And then finally, the coupling needs to change as well. So these are the changes coming from scaling variance. And you see, the two here is uh, classical 
breaking of scale invariance by the term in the Lagrangian, and it exists without quantum effects. For the anomalous dimensions and the beta functions, they are quantum effects and they are related to an additional breaking of scale invariance from loops. And so this additional breaking of scale invariance from loops is particularly interesting. It corresponds to this dimensional transmutation from before, a dynamical generation of mass scales. And um, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, so I think uh, let me not make any more comments because time is up, but I think you get the point that we have now derived finally a reformulation of the re for, uh, renormalization group equation in terms of this kellen semantic equation, which has a different physical interpretation even though it's mathematically very strongly related. But it gives you the additional uh, insight that scale invariance is an interesting symmetry in physics. Nature is not scale invariant and quantum field theories typically break scale invariance in two ways, namely either explicitly uh, or explicitly and um, quantum mechanically by the existence of beta and gamma functions. So that should be sufficient for today. And uh, let us then continue next week, uh, next Monday, with uh, the next topic. Okay, uh, thanks.